Appreciate it. Good morning. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be back with you. I've been on the road a couple weeks uh, in the past. It's always, it's always wonderful to be back with people of God on Sunday morning. So here we are. Close, uh, close readers of the news will know that uh, this summer it was reported that a huge phosphate rock deposit was discovered in southwestern Norway. Now, why does that matter? Why is that important? Well, this one area in Norway apparently contains enough minerals to meet the global demand for batteries and solar panels for the next 100 years. The mining company that discovered the jackpot reports that, quote, up to 70 billion tons of the non-renewable resource, that's phosphorus, may have been uncovered in southwestern Norway, they're confirming it right now this summer, along with deposits of other strategic minerals like titanium and vanadium. Uh, phosphate rock contains high concentrates of phosphorus, which is a key component for building green technologies, but currently faces significant supply issues. Supply issues no more, as the headlines attest. Here's headline number one. Massive mineral deposit discovery could meet global battery and solar panel demand for the next 100 years. Headline two, huge phosphate discovery in Norway could fully charge the electric vehicle industry. It's a nice little pun. Headline three, a huge Norwegian phosphate rock find is a boon for Europe. Headline four, Norway's new phosphate deposits are so massive they could guarantee solar power and electric cars keep running for the next 50 years. Okay, so they've dropped the number from 100 years to 50 years in this headline. Headline five, massive Norwegian phosphate rock deposit can meet fertilizer, solar, and EV battery demand for 50 years. 100 years or 50 years, that's a long time. That is a huge find in southwestern Norway. So who concentrated high-grade phosphate rock in Norway? And why? And to what end? And why are we just now finding it in 2023? For all the spiritual realities that we must figure out, and there are a lot of spiritual questions we need to resolve in the Christian life, there are a lot of questions to resolve about God's material universe and how he designed it the way that he did. And the Bible helps us resolve these questions in texts like Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy eight verses one to 10 is where we're gonna be primarily this morning. Deuteronomy 8, Moses is preparing his people to enter into the promised land. They were redeemed from a 430-year bondage in Egypt. That's a long imprisonment in Egypt. It's what we call the exodus, when God leads his people out of Egypt, and God's people have been wandering around now in the desert for 40 years. So 430 years plus 40 years of desert wandering on top of that. That is a hard life, a hard history. But God has upheld his people in many ways, as we'll soon see. And now God's people are getting ready to enter the promised land. They're now on the doorstep of the promised land in Deuteronomy 8. It's a new land, it's a good land, and it's furnished with everything they could possibly need, even the things that they will need for their future innovations. But first, God prepares their heart for it. We're simply going to walk through this text beginning in verse one, where Moses says this, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply. If Israel upholds their end of the covenant, God promises that his covenant people will flourish in this new land. They will live, they will multiply, they will become a strong nation if if they keep God at the center of their lives. They will, verse 1, uh, 1b, they will go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. So this was a long time coming, a long promise. That small cap Lord there that we see frames everything else that we're going to study in this passage. This is Yahweh, the great I am, the all-sufficient, self-sufficient I am who I am. That's who's speaking. That's who's promising these things to his people. He's promised to give them a land, a promise that is repeated 23 times in Deuteronomy over and over. God says, I promise you this land. I promise you this land. I promise you this land. This sworn land is fundamental 
to their identity. This land is their identity, right? It's tied to their identity. It is their national identity, and it is a pure gift, a pure gift from God. This is Yahweh's land. This is Yahweh's land. He made the world from nothing. Before any creature existed, God prepared this ground for his people, as we're going to see. Before dinosaurs even existed, the living God of the universe had prepared this place on earth for his future people. And it's a pure gift, not a payment for their holiness. It is not a payment for their holiness. In chapter 9, this point will be made very clear. Israel is not entering this new land as a reward for self-righteousness. It's a gift. This promised land belongs to Yahweh. He designed it. He made it. He owns it. And he's giving this as a gift of love to his people. And Israel will take possession of this land by faith. So Israel is warned, don't think that you're morally superior to all the other people in the world. All the other people that have lived previously on this land before you, you're not. This land will perpetually remind Israel of God's abundant kindness to undeserving sinners. A lesson they should have learned in the desert. Verse 2, and you shall remember, one of the key words in this text, remember, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So for 40 years, God has been humbling his people, bringing them low, testing them, squeezing out what's in their heart, because when you're brought low, your true self comes out, right? When you have pressure in your life, the true you comes out. So God sends adversity to his people to prove their faith, to prove their hearts. That's what this desert wandering has been for. It's like a furnace that burns away whatever is trivial and false and fake in our lives. God has been testing their heart, testing proofs that they they trust in God or they grumble. This whole text is about the heart. We're going to see this come up again. It's all about the heart. We're talking about technology, but we're talking really about the heart. Forty years of testing the hearts of his people. How did he do it? It looked like this. Verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Food is hard to find in the desert, right? We all know that. Manna was a miracle food. It looked like coriander seed. It uh, appeared in the desert on the ground every morning for 40 years. Every morning. Israel woke up. They gathered it daily from the ground. They ground it up. They boiled it uh, into a cake, a little cake that tasted oily and a little like honey. Oily and honey. Not bad. Didn't taste bad apparently, according to the descriptions. But where did this daily manna come from? No one knew. No one knew. It was a miracle from God. It's called the grain of heaven, made into the bread of angels and eaten in abundance. They had plenty of it, but it came every morning. It was a gracious, sustaining gift from God that tasted sweet, tasted pleasant. And God used this manna to prove a point to his people. Verse 3b, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. A huge general claim is being made here. Our mouths are needy. Our mouths are needy. God's mouth sustains all things. So contrast there. Farmers don't keep us alive. Safeway or Costco or Walmart don't keep us alive. We are kept alive by divine miracle. Manna was a miracle food to remind Israel and to remind all of us that life is a miracle. That we're alive right now is a miracle of God sustaining us. God says live and we're alive. Groceries are just a means that he uses to that end. Manna is just a means to that end. He cares about the means, but he's behind and over all of the means. And he says, live, and Israel lived. He says, live, and you live right now, and I live right now. We live by the word of God. That's one miracle of many miracles that Israel experienced. Verse 4, 
Your clothing did not wear out on you. (laughs) 40 years of desert wandering, wearing the same old clothes and the same old uh, sandals, and they never wore out. Since we moved to Phoenix a few years ago, the desert has been hard on our shoes. We go through shoes a lot in our family, not for Israel. God involved himself in their lives to the level of how fast their clothes wore out. Namely, they didn't. That's an amazing providence on display in the daily material provisions of his people. Verse 4b, and your foot did not swell these 40 years, 40 years of walking through the rocky desert in sandals, no foot injuries. What? (laughs) That's a miracle. All of my most painful injuries have been hiking in the desert, right? That's where I scrape my shins, twist my ankles. It's, It's dangerous walking through the desert. Not even a swollen foot for God's people, 40 years in the desert. Everything in the desert is prickly and sharp and dangerous, right? Not a swollen foot. Verse five, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Discipline is correction for wrongdoing. Parents discipline children. But more broadly, discipline is training in human behavior. In 40 years in the desert, God was discipling his people. He was resetting their behaviors. He was training them. He was preparing their hearts for a new land. He was preparing them to trust and obey him in all things. Verse 6, so you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him, fearing him. The basic point of verses two to six is this, arrogance is unfitting for the people about to inherit God's land. Arrogance is unfitting for people who are about to inherit God's land. So for 40 years, God was humbling his people, testing their hearts, training them, getting them ready for the good land. And all this prep builds up to the promised land itself. And that's where I want to focus this morning to turn our attention to what is so special about this land. Verse 7, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, R, capital D, Yahweh, the Lord is bringing them. God's people are being led by the hand towards a gift, led towards to a gift by their hand. Have you ever given someone a gift so big that you can't wrap it, right? It's so big, you can't wrap it. What do you do? You use a blindfold, right? You blindfold the person that you're gonna give the gift and then you lead them by the hand to the gift. Well, this is essentially what God is doing. God is leading his people by the hand to this enormous gift of the land. Again, this is his kindness and this framing this entire story. He's leading them to a good land. I love that phrase, a good land. That's its name. That's literally its name. We typically call it the promised land, but you can literally call it the good land. The good land, capital T-G-L. The good land, the good land. It has everything they will ever need to flourish in it. The land is useful. It is productive. It is abundant. It is beautiful. It's everything Egypt wasn't given to them as a gift. And that means for any desert people, water, (laughs) right? Water, verse 7. 7b, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and the hills. This good land is rich with water flowing deep under the ground. And where that water breaks out from deep, deep springs into fountains and flowing rivers, God made the land this way to look like this, to, to prosper this way. Long ago, God cut deep fountains into his creation. Uh, the, these descriptions of water speak of God's original work back when he made the land. God had pre-cut channels in the rock for water to flow to his people. Long ago, this, long, this land was readied for God's thirsty people before those people even existed. That's what we got to see in this text. This land was prepared for people before people existed. And of course, where water flows, grains abound. Verse 8, a land of wheat and barley, 
And of fruit too, verse 8b, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Uh, Remember when the spies took their first peek into the promised land? The evidence they took back were grapes, pomegranates, and figs, right? What what, What more do you need to prove that a land is the good land, that a lot of fruit? That's what they took back. Fruits to make jams, to make wines, to make wines flow like rivers. All of it is there, ready for God's people. And of course, you can't have a good land without, uh, verse 8c, a land of olive trees. Olives. Anyone here not like olives? Want, oh, that's disappointing. That was too many hands. <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> Olives are amazing. Uh, these are the oil-rich olives. That's what this, this promise is. These are not just olives. These are oil-rich olives, the best olives. This land flows with olive oil. Olive oil for worship sacrifices, oil to anoint, to do holy anointing, oil for cooking and for baking, oil for skin care and hygiene, oil for medicine to treat wounds, oil to fuel lamps and to give light, Olive oil was abundantly useful for God's people, for all of life, and it's already there. It's there, it's ready for them. Verse 8D, and honey, a land of honey. This land flows with milk and honey. That's typically what we say about the promised land. And you can't have honey without bread. Verse 9, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, nothing. That's the chief characteristic of the promised land. All scarcity and all shortage is completely negated. There's no lack. Why? Because the land is loaded with everything you could possibly materially need to flourish. God is comprehensively aware of their material lives like he's comprehensively aware of what we need in life. The land abounds. And that means, and here's where I want to camp for a bit, it is verse 9b, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. This land lacks nothing because it has been loaded with bronze and iron. Mentioned together, bronze and iron symbolize power and military strength in the Bible. That power and might is already in the land. Before God's people arrived, bronze and iron were put there to be found and to be used. Iron will be taken from stones. Iron meant wealth. It could be traded, and iron was immediately useful in all areas of life. Iron made tools for soldiers, tools for stone cutters, tools for farmers. Iron was was used for axles, reinforced wheels, chariots, All sorts of things could be used with iron. Even more diversely useful was copper. Copper will be excavated from mountains. It will be the most common material used in jewelry. It will be polished into mirrors. Copper mixed with tin made bronze, which is a hard and durable metal. Farmers will use bronze for plow points, for threshing sledges, for axes, pruning shears, yokes, sickles, all sorts of things. Soldiers will use bronze for chain, chain mail, armor, helmets, shields, javelins, bows, arrows, and for all the defensive fortifications that a city wall and gate will need. And lots of uses for it. Stonemasons will use bronze tools to cut and shape rock. God's worshipers will use copper and bronze musically to make symbols. Later on, when David prepares to build the temple, he will acquire iron and bronze beyond counting. Quantities beyond counting, we're told in the Bible. And then his son Solomon will take that iron and bronze beyond weighing, and he will build a temple, right? A temple that will dazzle the world with shiny copper things. Pots, shovels, basins, furniture, altars, entire doors, bronze hardware will be everywhere in the temple, and it's all by God's design. Israel's iron and copper was as much a gift from God as the manna that they ate every day in the wilderness journey. All these weapons, all these tools, all these decorations, God had coded them into the creation, 
into the promised land from the beginning of time. So Israel's good land lacks nothing because it has been preloaded with an abundance of metal for all of their future tools and technologies. Like those deep channels of water cut into the ground by God in creation, every tool, every technology Israel would eventually need was already mixed in the stones and the mountains and the soil by its creator. Here's one way I would summarize and sort of putting this together and other things you'll read about uh, from, from Scripture in the book. All of Israel's future tool needs were met and pre-coded into the good land by God from the beginning of time, a gracious gift of the Creator's design given in order to shape Israel's material future. It's a loaded statement. Let me read it again. All of Israel's future tool needs were met and pre-coded into the good land by God from the beginning of time, a gracious gift of the Creator's design given in order to shape Israel's material future. Okay. Spoiler alert. This is one of the ways that God guides the unfolding of human technology over time. There are certain things we discover at certain times. Israel didn't need phosphorus rock. They needed iron and copper. They didn't even know phosphorus rock was a thing. That's different in 2023. It's a staggering point that links God's sovereign plan for a nation and its future and its natural resources that he gives them. So who's getting the praise for these shiny metal things in Israel's future? The Lord. Yahweh, he's getting the praise for this. Verse 10, and you shall eat and be, whole, be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. It's all from him. It's a gift from him. There again is his name, the good land, a land without lack. So praise Yahweh, the creator of this good land. When you have all this prosperity, thank God for it, because it was all his design in the beginning. The implications of these verses deserve a full book, and that's what I tried to do. But here are three statements about human technology making that only people of faith can make. Only people of faith who see Deuteronomy 8 can make these points. Number one, God's creation guides our inventiveness. God's creation guides our inventiveness. The one who laid the foundations of the world is the one who dug deep channels for water, and the one who will channel that water and infuse into his creation not only water channels, but iron and copper to inspire his people's future innovations. So where does material technology come from? It comes from Yahweh. He has his people's future needs in mind when he designs the potential within the creation. It's he who thought, let's put 70 billion tons of high-grade phosphate rock in Norway for them to discover when they need it in 2023. That's exactly what the Creator does. People of faith have a category for this. Material discoveries shape our future, or better said, God's unfolding plan of natural resource discoveries shapes his sovereign design for the nations. Or to say it in another way, our inventions unfold according to the discoveries we continue to make in God's creation. God's promised land was not a handout to the passive. It's not a handout to the passive. It was a rich place meant to inspire human innovation. You see that? He, he put the metal there and said, go and make with it. He doesn't just hand them tools. He says, go invent tools. God calls his people to discover and invent and build, being gratefully aware that all of the material resources, even the imagination and the skill and planning, the energy at work and putting all this together, all of it is given to them by God. God governs the story of human inventiveness by how he designs the land. True for Israel's promised land, 
It's true for Norway, true for every nation. Theologians call this common grace. It applies to farming, applies to mining discoveries, applies to high-grade phosphate rock. Before dinosaurs existed, God put 60 elements into his creation, 60 elements. We discovered those elements, we excavated them, we refined them, we compressed them, and now we have iPhones made of 60 elements taken from creation. But don't be impressed with Apple. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Don't be impressed with Apple. The point here is that if God taught us to farm and to make tools and to pave highways and to dynamite tunnels out of rocks and to make batteries and solar panels and smartphones and rocket ships, what must God himself be able to do? That's what impresses us. He is brilliant. As the first cause of all that we can invent, new human inventions reveal to us more and more of the brilliance of the creator. Point number two, mining discoveries expose new glories of God. Mining discoveries expose new glories of God. Our friend Robert Krauss uh, from Italy preached here two summers ago. Anybody remember what his sermon was on two years ago? So good. It was a biblical theology of a material substance. Remember, a biblical theology of, what was it? Gold. Remember that? He laid out like gold in the Bible. It was stunning. It was a stunning sermon. I went back to my sermon notes this morning just to remember like what he had said. In that sermon, he talked about the Exodus. Remember? He talked about the Exodus and Israel walking out of Egypt clad in gold jewelry, right? So, so God's people are coming out of Egypt and they're, they're just wearing gold. <laughs> they are loaded with the spoils of Egypt, right? And he talked about the image that comes to my mind is like Mr. T, you know, with the gold. But imagine this whole nation. That's not Robert's words. That's my words. Imagine God's entire nation coming out of Egypt and they're all, they've got gold bracelets. They've got gold necklaces. They've got gold. They're trying to carry the plunders of Egypt out. And in the desert sunshine, what would that have looked like? I mean, they would have just sparkled, right? Incredible image. And, And Robert made this point. Uh, how did they plunder Egypt's gold? Robert rewound the story for us way back before humans existed when God decided to scatter into the earth a precious metal. He called it a special stardust. I love that, special stardust. And then God created people. He set set apart his own people. And then he locked those people into Egyptian captivity for 430 years. Why 430 years? Robert said to give the Egyptians 430 years of time to discover that gold, to excavate it, to refine it, and to store it up for God's people to plunder in the end. That is a great God-centered way to think of the material world. Even though God's people are going to fumble that gold big time, right? The golden calf, that story does not end well. The point is that our mining discoveries slowly reveal more and more of the Creator's generosity to us over time. We won't go there, but Job 28 is a great text on mining. It's all about mining. You you can read it for fun on your own time. Job 28, uh, which is a hymn that celebrates human technology, specifically of man's technological ability to excavate what's in the earth. I bring up Job 28 because I want to read this uh, quote from Abraham Kuyper who's a Dutch theologian from the uh, 18th, uh, 19th century. He wrote this, quote, on the slide, Abraham Kuyper wrote this, quote, man was designed and intended for digging up what God has hidden in the earth and for glorifying the greatness of God through doing this. God enclosed gold and silver, all precious metals and precious stones in the heart of the earth And if there had been no human beings to bring these treasures to the surface and to let the luster of the gold shine and to bring out the brilliance of the diamond by cutting it, then God would never have received the honor and praise for these, his more delicate creations in the material, in the mineral kingdom. That's an amazing worldview. True of gold, silver, diamonds, precious stones, and high-grade phosphate, and the resources that make our economy work. Miners bring to the surface what otherwise unknown creative brilliance of our God. 
We see the brilliance of God by what we mine out of the ground. So be blown away by oceans and by mountains and by the Milky Way and the night sky. Be blown away by all the things that humans can't touch that God did by himself. And be blown away by what we find inside the crust of the earth. All of it declares to us God's glory. Point number three, finally, creation's imperative. Creation leaves us with an imperative. We come to the end of the sermon, and that imperative is to worship the creator. Worship the creator. Look to him and praise him. Don't miss the main point of why mining exists. Kuiper just said it. Yet it's so easy to miss. Israel failed here, right? Israel failed here, and we will too, if we're not careful, we must too heed God's warning in verses 17 and 18. So, so what's the safe way to go here? Should we just uh, diss on the material world? Should we just diss on mining, hate on technology, uh, hate on human innovation as being just arrogance, just what humans do? Uh, ignore that discovery in Norway, just like, psh, that's just worldly. How do we respond? Verse 17, beware. Beware lest you say in your heart. Here it is again. Deuteronomy 8 is all about the heart. Okay, we're not talking about minerals at the end of the day. We're talking about the heart. What industri industries do with all that high-grade phosphate rock in Norway is one thing. What our heart does with all that high-grade phosphate rock in Norway is the concern of God at the heart. That's the bigger question. Do you see God in it or not? What's your heart do with the material wealth of this life? What is our heart's posture to culture making and city building and human tech making? Here's the temptation. This is the temptation, the warning. Don't do this. Don't say this. Verse 17b, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. That's the fail. That's the fail. God's people, you're entering, entering the promised land. You've got all this metal. You're going to make all sorts of shiny new tools. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't say this. So Israel, when you've been in the land for a while, you're going to stand back and you're going to enjoy the skyline of your cities. You will look at the houses that you have made, the new shoes and the new clothes that you wear, all the copper and the brass and the iron tools that you invented to make your life prosper. You will see oil and wine flowing from your industries. You will see farmers hauling carts of grain. You will see bakeries full of bread. Your markets will be full of food. You will make banks and financial systems and succeed in international trade. And if you fail to see God's generosity behind all of it, you are an idolater. Indeed, verse 18a, you shall remember, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. So when we discover 70 billion tons of high-grade phosphate rock in Norway and we read the headlines about how this massive mineral deposit discovery could meet global battery and solar panel demand for the next 100 years, what should our hearts do? We worship the Creator. That's the imperative of creation. It should go immediately to God and his generosity, his unfolding generosity. He has these gifts that he holds back for us to discover in 2023 that weren't needed much before 2023. And what else does he put in creation? I don't know. Gift after gift after gift, the God who gives out manna day by day in the desert is the same God who plants mineral deposits in the earth so that we have batteries. Same God, same generosity. Do you see it? Do you see him? We're not Israel, but these words to Israel apply to all of us. Every single nation is held accountable to this in verses 19 to 20. Why did God boot out all the other nations out of this land for his people Israel? Because they didn't do this. They didn't thank Yahweh for all the material things that this land had. He said he booted them out. Verses 19 to 20, we're not gonna study it, but you can see it right there in the text. Yahweh made everything from nothing. We make nothing out of nothing. Everything we make is out of something, right? Why does this building look the way it does? Because God gave us 
what we created as cement and iron, right? If God did not give us cement and iron to use, this building would look totally different. If God didn't invent aluminum, our lives would look totally different. If he didn't give us phosphorus, our life would look totally different. The reason why this world looks the way it is is because God pre-patterned this world into his creation when he gave it to human creatures to sub-create. That blew my mind. When I realized that, I'm studying Deuteronomy 8 and I'm writing this book, I realize this is something that atheists were coming to, to terms with. Oh, did you realize that if we didn't have these materials in the crust of the earth, this world wouldn't look the way it looks? And I was like, well, I've never heard a Christian say that. <laughs> and I'm like, that's right. This is all Yahweh's plan. He put the iron, he put the copper there. Why? So that Israel would use iron and copper to develop their tools. Everything you see looks the way it does because God made this creation the way he did. Did we invent fossil fuels? <laughs> did we invent aluminum? Nuclear fusion? Did we invent nuclear fusion? That's how the sun burns. Solar power, electricity. Remember the electricity lightning message that I did? Where did electricity come from? We didn't invent electricity. God created it in lightning. You see, your, your eyes just, just start to open up. And it's like, this is what our teens need when it comes to technology and stewarding technology. If we don't give them this foundation, if all we're doing is saying, no, you can't have the device until you're a certain age. No, you can't have that app. Don't look at that stuff online. Never do this. No, you can't. If it's just prohibition-based parenting and we don't ever give them this foundation, they'll have no understanding of why God gave us technology and tools and batteries to steward, to enjoy, and to live in a life of glorifying God by loving him and loving others through the gifts that he's given us. There won't be any foundation for that stewardship. There's so much to say. My, I'm, I'm so lost in my manuscript now. I don't even know where I'm at. Um, but this is the foundation for understanding uh, an entire theology of technology is to see God's generosity and his graciousness in all of the gifts that he has given us. The two big mistakes that you can make is one, you can be a secular materialist who just looks at technology and says, this is how we're going to save ourselves. We don't need God. We don't need the resurrection. We're going to use tools and technology to save ourselves. And there's another group on the other side that is, you can even find them in the church. They're more Luddites. They're like, yeah, we have technology, but I hate it. It's just like human things. Humans doing human things, right? Smart smartphones are just worldly things. Um, some mining company is going to take all this, um, this wealth in, in, in Norway, and it's just corporate greed, you know, just write it all off, right? And both of those worldviews are man-centric, right? Neither of them do justice to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and the God-centeredness of human technologies. So when you buy brand new synthetic Nike, Nike running shoes and they don't wear out fast and your, your foot doesn't swell up because they're great shoes, who gets the glory? When you buy clothes that don't wear out fast and you have them for years, does that full closet of clothes remind you of the generosity of Israel's God? Or do you think, wow, the textile industry is really good, right? When you awake in the morning and your pantry has bread in it again, do you see God's generosity as if he were feeding you manna every day? Do you live by the word of God or do you live by Costco, right? Who gets the glory? Who gets the credit? What does your heart do with the divine generosity in our bread, in our batteries, in our solar panels, our skyscrapers, our smartphones, our cars, and our houses? Who gets the glory? This is one of the wars that we fight in the tech age, the war to remember, the war to see God's generosity to us in very tangible, practical ways, like batteries. This awakening to God's generosity is the beginning of all of our tech stewardship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how dull we become to your abundant generosity. I see it in my own heart. I face it in my own heart. Dull to your abounding kindness. We enjoy in this life, we enjoy a tech wealth beyond anything the world has ever seen before. 
blind most days to the generosity of yourself in it. Open our hearts, open our eyes to see your incredible kindness all around us. Worship stands in the balance. Will we remember you in it? Will we worship you in it? Or will we forget you? Every innovative people on earth is given this ultimatum. Open spiritual eyes in Norway, open spiritual eyes in America, here in Phoenix. We, land, we live in a land flowing with iron and copper and aluminum and silicon and lasers and gasoline and nuclear energy and computer chips and gadgets and high-grade phosphate rock. Protect us from idolizing our innovations. They won't save us. Protect us from hating technology as if it's simply man doing worldly things. Both of those worldviews will belittle you and neither open our eyes to your generosity behind it all. Grant us that we be glad, glad-hearted stewards of everything you've given us as we remember your kindness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>